Since 1854, the Sacramento Pioneer Association has been preserving Sacramento and California history for future generations. We're proud of our role as community historians and are pleased to sponsor this production. RCA Community Fund is a proud supporter of this program. Tucked neatly in the middle of Sacramento's historic Old City Cemetery is a section known as Pioneer Grove. This is the final resting place of many of Sacramento's most famous early citizens. They were doctors and lawyers, architects and builders, politicians and laymen. Most came west in search of gold. Many left when those dreams failed to materialize. But these men and women chose to stay. They settled the land, built Sacramento, helped establish California statehood, and ultimately opened up the West for others to follow. They're buried here because they have one thing in common. All were members of an organization called the Sacramento Pioneer Association. Brian Witherell runs Witherell's Auction House in Sacramento. Today, he's anxiously awaiting the arrival of a Gold Rush era artifact. It's here. Yes. Is this the locket? It is. Brian, who also sits on the board of directors for the Sacramento Pioneer Association, recently helped them acquire the artifact. A very rare gold locket. It's the mother of all gold spike oh, wow. lockets. Beautiful. Look at this piece. Engineer David Hughes, who commissioned the golden spike used at the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, also commissioned 12 of these lockets from leftover gold used to create the spike. 11 were handed out when the rails were joined in Promontory, Utah on May 10, 1869. Of those that were made, we know of about five that exist today. This particular locket came from the family of Hughes's wife. The association will donate the $20,000 piece to the California State Railroad Museum, where it will be displayed next to one of the actual golden spikes. It's a big gift, but this kind of philanthropy is nothing new to the pioneers. The Sacramento Pioneer Association began as a fraternal society in Sacramento in 1854. It was organized by original pioneers of the California Gold Rush. California's first pioneers were very aware that they were part of history. They were breaking out into a part of the country that was very unexplored. They were seeking their fortune, but they were establishing a new community and they were building a new state. So unquestionably, they understood that this was a momentous occasion. And I think they realized that it was something that might not happen again. And so they were making every effort to document it. In truth, the Sacramento Pioneer Association might never have come to be, were it not for one early pioneer. The morning of January 24, 1848, began pretty much like any other for 37-year-old James Marshall. Marshall had been tasked with building a sawmill near Coloma, California, by his employer, Captain John Sutter. He'd spent the last few days deepening a man-made channel called the tail race, so more water could come through to power the saw. After finishing his breakfast, he headed out on this cold, clear morning to inspect the progress. James Marshall was a unique individual. Some people would have described him as odd. He was a bit of a loner. But apparently he was a hard worker. He was uh, an excellent man for the job that John Sutter hired him for. Every morning, he tended to walk through the tail race to inspect the work that had been done the previous day. And he noticed something shiny in the, uh, the water of the tail race. 
he reached down and picked it up, and he thought, and rightly so, that it could be gold. What he really found that day, in, in terms of the, its physical size and shape, was um, quite small, but its impact on the state and to world history uh, cannot be overstated. It was absolutely tremendous. Within only a few months, Marshall's discovery set off a worldwide frenzy that ultimately led to the largest human migration in history. By the time the gold rush ended, roughly nine years later, more than 300,000 people had dropped everything and come to California seeking their fortunes. Almost none got rich. Most barely made enough to survive. James Marshall joined the Sacramento Pioneer Association in 1860. He was one of the unfortunate majority who never saw any real money from the gold rush he inadvertently caused. He died penniless 25 years later on August 10, 1885. The California gold rush as we know it, if you look at the, the grand sweep of time here in Sacramento, was really just a flash in the pan. Thousands of people inundated the city. Of course, they were here in hopes for easy riches, never intending to necessarily stay in California. And so many of the people who didn't find the easy riches, who uh, mined out, uh, left. But some people looked around. They looked around this area and said, the gold rush is over, but there is still a living to be had in this city. And those folks form the core of what we consider the Sacramento pioneers. The charter members of the Sacramento Pioneer Association, they came from more of the professional walks of life. They were not the rough and tumble, hard drinking, hard fighting miners that we tend to think of in the Old West. There's been a big myth that developed that the people who came here to California during the gold rush were poor or illiterate, and that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, if you were going to come to California at that time, you had to have money. But the majority of the people that came here had a skilled trade. They were business people. Um, they were bankers. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were artists. And they came here for a reason. In addition to would-be prospectors, Many savvy merchants and later Pioneer Association members also saw golden opportunities in the untamed West. Men like Mark Hopkins, who along with three others would change the face of the country. Irish immigrant James McClatchy, who would build a newspaper empire here. Master carpenter Philitis Burnett, his second business in town, Burnett and Sons Planing Mill and Lumber Company, is still in operation and is one of the longest running family owned businesses in Sacramento. And General Albert Maver Wynn, considered by many to be the father of Sacramento city government. These were only a few of the many pioneers who would accomplish great things from and for Sacramento. Almost overnight, the population of Sacramento exploded. The city had grown from a handful of residents in 1848 to several thousand by 1850, and it showed no signs of slowing. When you see those very few images of Sacramento, one of which is in the Pioneer's collection, this very rural view of Sacramento at the time, uh, you realize just how undeveloped the city was. And when you look at how rapidly they developed a city. It was a metropolitan city within a decade. You have to think about what happens to a place that didn't exist, that was nothing, then all of a sudden becomes the focus of the world. And as all of these people rush in from all over the world, they're all bringing with them their concepts of self, their identity, and their prejudices. Realizing Sacramento needed a sense of order a group of concerned citizens set out to create a formal government for the fledgling city. They elected a city council on August 1st, 1849, and appointed Albert Maver Wynn its first president. The charter members of the Sacramento Pioneer Association strongly believed that there was a social contract between the citizens, government, and business. And they wanted to foster this relationship and actually create uh, society, create culture, create civilization. These members were entrepreneurs. They were the builders of Sacramento. Through the fortitude and tenacity of several of the early pioneers, the tent city by the river appeared to be on the verge of becoming a permanent city. 
But a new decade was on the horizon, and it would test all of Sacramento in ways no one could imagine. The 1850s began ominously with a series of storms that pummeled the region beginning in December of 1849. Sacramento, for the most part, was very low ground. And the Sacramento River, the American Rivers, both would swell, overflow their banks. On January 11th, both the American and Sacramento Rivers crested, flooding the city up to second story windows. The Great Inundation, as it became known, decimated Sacramento. James Blackwell Starr was an early pioneer who stepped up to help his fellow Sacramentans during the crisis. He owned the building on the corner of K and Front. And when the floods came, he actually had people stay on the upper floors with them, women and children. He brought them in for shelter and so forth and gave people food and clothing. The waters eventually receded and the city set about rebuilding. Good news came on February 27th, when it was announced Sacramento had formally incorporated as a city. A little more than six months later, on September 9, 1850, California became the 31st state in the Union. But the year wasn't over, and more growing pains were yet to come. This is the earliest known photograph of Sacramento, probably taken around October 20, 1850. It shows the side-wheel steamer New World tied up at the Sacramento waterfront, not long after she offloaded a crowd of new immigrants to the region, one of whom carried the plague of the 19th century, cholera. The disease swept through Sacramento, killing indiscriminately. More than 600 people, including 17 doctors, were dead within a month. General Albert Maver Wynn was very impressed by the tragedy of this epidemic, the massive death, the, uh, just the horror. He spent his own money to build coffins for the dead. And so um, he actually got himself in, into debt, taking care of, of the deceased. The city still hadn't fully recovered from the cholera epidemic when the next tragedy struck. Just past 11 o'clock on the night of November 2nd, 1852, the cry of fire rang throughout the city. The conflagration had begun in a mill house and fueled by high winds, quickly spread from building to building. There were only two or three buildings that survived in this area from the 52 fire. But I kind of see it as that great cleansing because all of this is that constant war with nature. How do we survive in this environment? And so the decision is, is that we build with brick. The whole concept is to build that stable environment and the pioneers are a big part of that. Mark Hopkins Wholesale Grocery was one of the casualties of the fire. Undeterred by the setback, Hopkins would go on to build a new store, this time with a new partner, another future Pioneer Association member named Collis P. Huntington. Their dry goods store, located on the corner of 4th and I Streets, opened in 1855. The incredible success of that business helped them become two of the wealthiest men in the West. And in 1852, a young entrepreneur named Charles Frederick Crocker also established a successful dry goods store in town. Within two years, he was one of the wealthiest men in Sacramento. There really was kind of this core of entrepreneurs who were here early on and were buying up the property and really being able to control the economy in some way because they would buy low and sell high and they were the people that were making money. Many more trials would befall Sacramento before the decade ended. But the citizens always pulled themselves up and rebuilt. It was a culture uh, that we don't see today, a culture in which you could be knocked down, but everybody got up. You know, cities were burned to the ground, were flooded out, businesses were lost, but they got up, they had spirit, they had motivation. We do, as a city, have an indomitable spirit, and it would have been very easy, I suppose, for those early landowners to just dust their hands of it, but I know they felt the idea that they were here to stay and they were going to make it work and whether it be the use of technology, sheer grit, 
they were going to make a city out of where no city belonged. And I still think that's all part of the spirit that, that really started from the very beginning. By the end of 1853, Sacramento had grown into a full-fledged metropolis. And many of the early pioneers who helped build and define the city wanted a way to honor their accomplishments. On January 19, 1854, the Sacramento Daily Union ran an article announcing the formation of a new fraternal organization made up of citizens who were pioneers. Six days later, on January 24th, a group of more than 100 early emigrants to California met at the Jones Hotel and established the Sacramento Pioneer Association. The original members of the Sacramento Pioneer Association tended to be among the upper echelon of Sacramento society. In fact, the first president of the Sacramento Pioneer Association was an attorney by the name of Joseph Webb Winnins, and he was actually married to a niece of Samuel Brannan, who was the first millionaire in California. The membership roster for those charter members not only reads like a who's who of Sacramento society, but also includes names of national renown. The Sacramento Pioneer Association possesses a book that contains the signatures of four presidents of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, and William Howard Taft. Each of these presidents accepted honorary membership into the Sacramento Pioneer Association. Another major 19th century figure also accepted honorary membership. Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman. A West Point graduate with a background in engineering, Sherman, along with John Sutter Jr. and Civil War General Edward Ord, laid out the streets for Sacramento in 1848. If you look up William Tecumseh Sherman, if you just do a quick internet search, you're gonna find all kinds of stuff about the Civil War, but William Tecumseh Sherman was really made in California. His identity was made in California. He was here at such a pivotal time, and he was here in a unique position. In 1852, Sherman was elected the first president of the newly formed Sacramento Valley Railroad. The small railroad was only the second operational line west of the Mississippi. It ran between Sacramento and Folsom from 1855 till 1877. By the end of the 1850s, thanks in no small part to the gold rush, Sacramento had become a prosperous city. Many a pioneer had settled here and opened businesses that brought them fabulous wealth. Having achieved great success in business and politics, Charles Crocker joined forces with three other California tycoons in a partnership that would change history. They called themselves the Associates. History would remember them as the Big Four. On July 1, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Act into law. The act provided federal government support for the building of a transcontinental railroad that would link California with the East. It also authorized the creation of two companies to build the railroad, the Central Pacific in the West and the Union Pacific in the Midwest. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad became a race because that government subsidy was involved. It's the only reason it happened. And so these companies that were incorporated, the Union Pacific Railroad building from the east to the west, the Central Pacific Railroad incorporated for the purpose of building from the west to the east, were competing to lay as much track as possible. This mural, on display at the Sacramento Valley train station, depicts the Central Pacific's groundbreaking ceremony which took place at Sacramento's Front and K Streets on January 8, 1863. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad was a mammoth undertaking that would take six and a half years to complete. At the height of construction, the project would employ more than 12,000 laborers, 90% of them Chinese. The two lines met at Promontory Point, Utah, and on May 10, 1869, Leland Stanford, governor of California and president of the Central Pacific Railroad, used a silver hammer to drive in a ceremonial final spike made of gold to signify the joining of the East and the West forever. Several members of the pioneers made the journey to witness the event. Much of what we know about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, we know because of one man, photographer Alfred A. Hart. 
Working for the Central Pacific, Hart documented the construction of the railroad in stereo 3D photography. Hart, although inexperienced, went out and captured not only the shots that detailed the different aspects of building the Transcontinental Railroad, but really captured the great grandeur and beauty of those spaces even as they were being altered. The interesting thing about Hart is he created all of these amazing images and he would end up dying as a pauper and his body was literally donated to science and we have no idea where he was buried. Mead B. Kibbe, past president of the Sacramento Pioneer Association, decided that he would build a cenotaph in memory of Alfred A. Hart and place it on his own plot within Pioneer Grove in the Sacramento City Cemetery. The board of directors of the Sacramento Pioneer Association decided in August of 2018 that Mr. Hart should posthumously become an honorary member of the Sacramento Pioneer Association. Hart's photos have been displayed in museums across the country, including the Crocker Museum, and are now housed permanently at the California State Library. Over the next several decades, the Sacramento Pioneer Association continued its mission of preserving the past. In the late 1800s, they helped the native sons of the Golden West restore a forgotten and almost completely destroyed icon of Sacramento's past. Sutter's Fort. But it would be a century after the building of the Transcontinental Railroad before another member of the Sacramento Pioneer Association would again change the West. Aubrey Neesham was a pioneer in historic preservation. He believed and wrote passionately about the significance of Sacramento as an historic city. Around the turn of the century, what is old Sacramento now was sort of neglected. The city that was built by the river, built because of the river, the city turned its back to the river and began looking to the east and expanding um, to the east and to the south and then later the north. By the 1950s, this part of the city was a skid row, which was considered one of the worst slum areas west of the Mississippi River. Plans had been in place for years to build a new freeway, Interstate 5, through West Sacramento. But the plan changed when Macy's wanted to build an anchor store on K Street near the waterfront. They would only build there if the city would guarantee easy freeway access for their customers. To do that, the city would need to tear down much of old Sacramento. Usually highways follow the path of least resistance, and old Sacramento was the path of least resistance. And so the very reason that the highway was sited where it was is because it was perceived that this area had very low value. These buildings, many of them more than 100 years old, have witnessed some of the most interesting and famous events in the history of the American West. To the unknowing eye, they would appear to be worthless. But to know what happened here is to know their true value as part of our heritage. V. Aubrey Nisham realized that there was history laying there that was going to be destroyed. Old buildings from the 1850s, the 1860s, that would be absolutely tragic to lose. He was the person who spearheaded the effort to rebuild, to preserve, and to revitalize old Sacramento. Aubrey Neesham successfully lobbied to save and renovate the portions of old Sac which wouldn't be destroyed by the freeway. The Sacramento Plan, as it became known, was the first time historic preservation efforts and federal redevelopment funds were used together to restore in a historic district. Old Sacramento is important today because it is history in the service of the present. That it's a reminder of what we are, what we've been through, and how we have overcome adversity as a city, as a people, and will continue to do so, whatever our future should be. The stories of resilience are here. They're enshrined in the buildings around us. They're enshrined in the rail that runs through it. This is local history to us, but it's world history to everyone else, and we're at the very center of it. Today, more than 160 years after its founding, and with 250 active members, the Sacramento Pioneer Association is continuing the legacy of philanthropy and historic preservation 
set forth by their forefathers. Over their long history, they've amassed a remarkable collection of historically significant artifacts, ranging from two cannons from Sutter's Fort, donated by John Sutter himself, to 13-year-old May Hollister Woolsey's trunk, a virtual time capsule of a young girl's life in Sacramento in the 1870s, both on display at the Sacramento History Museum. The Abbott family's gold locket will be displayed at the California State Railroad Museum. And the Center for Sacramento History houses the almost complete collection of membership rosters and meeting minutes from the early years of the Sacramento Pioneer Association. All of these remarkable objects remind us not only of our rich history as Sacramentans, but who we are today and where we've come from. The legacy of the Sacramento Pioneer Association is the same as the mission of the early pioneers to collect, preserve, and share the early history of those pioneers who came to California, who formed the germ of the state, whose love of independence, sagacity, entrepreneurship led to the building of this great city and this great state. Since 1854, the Sacramento Pioneer Association has been preserving Sacramento and California history for future generations. We're proud of our role as community historians and are pleased to sponsor this production. RCA Community Fund is a proud supporter of this program.